Welcome to episode 270 of Sports Geek. On this week's episode, I chat journalism, Twitter, and the appeal of grassroots sports with journalist Richard Hines. Welcome to Sports Geek, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host who will be at the MCG on March 8th for ICC Women's World T20 Final, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. Yes, my name is Sean Callanan, and you can and you will find me at the MCG on March 8th for the ICC Women's World T20 Final uh, at the MCG where they are trying uh, to break a world record on International Women's Day. So it'll be interesting to see Please check it out uh, and see how they go. Um, who We're not sure yet as I'm recording this who is going to be playing, but we do know that Katy Perry will be there and hopefully they're going to try to fill the MCG, which will be uh, an amazing effort uh, by the team um, from the T20 Organising Committee. Um, as always, you can find me on all parts of the internet, whether it be via email, sean at sportsgeekhq.com or via Twitter at Sean Callanan at Sports Geek on most channels. Um, and don't forget, you can send in your questions. If you've got a question from today's interview or from a previous podcast you've listened or you want my opinion on something or there's a trend you would like some analysis of, uh, simply send me a question. Uh, go to sportsgeekhq.com slash questions um, and I'll answer them in the Q&A series that gets released on a Friday morning, um, Australian time, of course. Um, so send in those questions via that method or you can ask me in real life and I might repurpose some of those questions uh, so you might see me at a sports biz Melbourne event or maybe at a cricket match or a football match or a basketball match. Before we jump into today's chat with Richard Hines, a longtime sports journalist to talk about the latest trends and how the industry has changed from a journalist point of view, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about our Patreon campaign and welcome a new startup supporter. Uh, Jer- Jeremy uh, Bainon, and I hope I've said your name wrong because I did have a friend in primary school that was Benyon, and I keep going to say that. Uh, but Jeremy Bainon from Boom Stats Analysis has come on board as a startup supporter. I really do appreciate the support, Jeremy. Uh, you can check out Boom Stats Analysis. Um, it is a cloud, f- it is a affordable cloud-based, responsible data gathering platform which enables players, coaches, and clubs to evaluate their performance based on in-match results with no bias. So go to Boom Stats Analysis and check it out. Uh, If you go to Boom, (laughs) you can go to boomstatsanalysis.com. You will find all things Boom Stats Analysis and it's just a way and that analytics for everyone. So if you want to be like Jeremy and support the podcast and the content that we're doing across the sports business space, you can do so um, at our Patreon campaign, sportsgeekhq.com slash Patreon. Uh, You can do it for as little as uh, $4 a month. Or if you're a startup supporter, if you're a startup uh, that is looking to reach the sports biz audience, please uh, sign up as Jeremy has done. Or if you're a sports technology brand or uh, or someone that wants to reach this sports geek audience, you can do so as a silver or gold supporter. Check it all out, sportsgeekhq.com slash Patreon. Thanks again, Jeremy. Um, You will find links to all the people who are supporting the podcast in the show notes and in the regular email, Sports Geek News. So if you're looking at those logos down the bottom and you're wondering what they are, you can click on them and find out more about some of the businesses that do support our efforts in the podcasting and newsletter space. Now, let's get into my chat with Richard Hines. He's a long-time sports journalist based in Melbourne um, that covers a multitude of sports um, as a columnist and has worked at a few different media outlets, and we talk about all things media and journalism, how it's changed over the years. Here's my chat with Richard Hines. I'm here on a... uh on a very wet uh, day here in uh, in Fitzroy, but I'm joined by Richard Hines, a sports journalist here in Melbourne. Welcome to the podcast. Nice to be with you, Sean. Thanks for having me on the pod. No, no worries. Well, first of all, get you know, I always ask people um, at the start of the interview, how did how did you get your start in in the world of sport and sports journal- journalism in particular? 
Well, bit of a long story because I, I started my cadetship at the old Afternoon Herald straight out of high school in 1984 and I was always on a, on a path to, to cover politics. I, first of all, I did a lot of police reporting and then I went to state parliament, did industrial relations. And on the same day, I was offered a spot up in Canberra, which had always been my dream. But just coincidentally, a really good sports editor called Jeff Slattery had joined the Herald and yep. some friends had worked for him and I thought, you know what, I'll do that for a year before I get into uh, the other side of what I wanted to do. About 30 years later, I'm still doing sport. It's, it's an addictive profession. Yeah. It's, it's the old cliche, but you're paid to go to the footy, you're paid to cover the Olympics, you're paid to be at Augusta and Wimbledon and it was an addictive path for me and I've, I've loved every minute of it. Very much a sliding doors moment. Yeah, very much so. You know, like I said, I was always on that path. I was really interested in politics and still am. Um, but I just got on this path and it allowed me, I guess, sport at the time was one of the areas where you could have a voice. So I started writing, you know, colour pieces and profiles and eventually became a columnist. So I was able, able to voice an opinion and write more colourfully. My friends who went up to Canberra were spending um, cold mornings sticking uh, recorders under the noses of politicians at six six o'clock in the morning and that didn't appeal at the time. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I caught up with uh, Simon Matthews who who's, was in the media manager role at, at Essendon and, and now at Richmond and we discussed a little bit about how that has changed over – over time, how has it changed from your side of the your side of the fence, being the being the journalist and seeing you know footy clubs rise up and be their own media departments and their own media channels? How has it been from your side? Yeah, I'm often asked this if, if I speak to students and so forth, and I guess the two areas are access and platforms. And when I talk about access, I always talk about how when I first started, my first assignment was to go down and cover Melbourne Football Club, who were yep. on the rise then in the, the late eighties under John Northey. And my typical day of covering football then was evening training because all the players had come from work and you'd stand on the boundary and talk to the team manager, talk to the, the doctor, Peter Bruckner, who's become quite uh, a celebrity himself, yep. Peter, in later, in later life. You'd get all the news of what was happening. Then the coach would come off. You'd have a yarn to him. You'd say good day to the few players you knew. Then you'd go into the sheds and talk to the players and come out with a story. Yep. Whereas now, you know, 30 years, 30 more years later, um, if kid, the kids covering it now go down to training and they get one player selected randomly who might not even be part of the story of the day standing in front of a sponsor board, yep. they're, they're lucky to have the numbers of a coach or players or whatever, you know. So access has changed tremendously and I understand the reasons for that. I mean, the amount of media covering um, has grown enormously, you know, the demands, the wishes of clubs to hive off their own media for their own commercial yep. areas. I mean, that's changed a lot but I... I would find it difficult now and, you know, if I had to make that Canberra sport choice knowing what I do about access to athletes now, I might have made, gone the other way. And then when I talk about platforms, that's obviously the, you know, online initially and then social media and the demands to interact in that space. I mean, I, I was really fortunate early in my career I covered, you know, a lot of Olympics and I, I took the golf and tennis rounds for a while so I'd be at Wimbledon and Augusta and you could go watch the sports, go and talk to people, sit down and write your one or two stories for the day. Yeah. It then became a 24-hour cycle. Everything was online. Everything had to be first. And and so we have that question in the media now, are you, are you better off being first or being right? Yeah. And getting that balance right, I mean, it sounds obvious. Of course, you need to be right first. But the pressures, again, on young journalists to have that story first, to have that exclusive, they're enormous. So... Again, I, I've, I've stepped away from that everyday kind of reporting and I don't miss that particular pressure. Occasionally I might watch Wimbledon or watch, you know, a big yeah. event and whimsically sort of wish to be there, but I certainly don't wish to have that 24-hour pressure that they um, work under now. Well, that's the thing. You've got so many players. Like when you started, like there was three, you know, two to three newspapers and, and two or three TV channels and that's where you had to go to get, to get a job. And now digital has become limitless but has also become, yeah, like you said, relentless in the de demand for content. Like the appetite for content hasn't subsided. We haven't had sports fans say, no, no, we're full. Like we don't need any more content. And so it does make it tough to, one, cut through that cut through mm. that noise from a from a journalism point of view. Yeah, and I, and I don't in any way, you know, when I talk about the access the journalists have and the pressure they have, I don't in any way belittle the work they're doing now. In some ways I think they're vastly superior in terms of, you know, their go-getterism and, you know, yep. I, I, um, 
I was a contemporary of Eddie Maguire and I rec- he and Steve Quartermain at the time were the two young um, TV news reporters and they and changed the dynamic of how it was done. You know, it used to be, I remember going when I was at RMIT, I did an attachment with Channel 7 and I went in with, you know, it was I think it was Sandy Roberts or the others and Peter Landy and the, the guys of the time, they would yep. go in and pick up the paper, maybe bring up someone, go and do a 90-minute, 90 90-second 90 interview, come back and that was their day's work done, whereas um, Eddie and Quarters and then guys guys like Craig Hutchinson after them, yep. they pioneered news breaking on on TV and that changed everything for us in newspapers because, again, again we were losing that advantage we'd have. We'd always be – they would follow us and we'd find that we were having to follow them at times. We'd be – looking at the the six o'clock news so that changed the dynamic and then of course that's gone on to other platforms online um social media and that's accelerated that news cycle again you might ask well the quality of that you know where where is that first versus right dynamic where is the depth of the reporting in that but i still think you know it's a particular skill in itself and i really admire those who do it well yeah and i think the the um there is it does seem to be a pullback, and there definitely seems to be offerings in market now where people still want that depth because you can only be skimming the surface on, you know, reading a tweet and liking something and seeing something come through, and you mm. want to know more about the player and the story behind the player, and you know, have true storytellers tell those stories. And so we're seeing, you know, things like Netflix doing long things, you know, ESPN thirty for thirty. What the athletics doing, and and you know what Bill Simmons is trying to do with longer form content. Everyone keeps saying, "Oh, it's coming back," but there's a little case it never went away. It's just the noise makes it a bit tougher to sometimes find that find those pieces. Yeah, look, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I my love of sports writing grew out of having a my HSC English lit teacher was an American, and his yep. father would send him copies of Sports Illustrated and the Sporting News and books from America, and he'd pass them on to me when he was finished, and so I. I got that real sense of that depth of, of writing and then, you know, when I lived in England for a while, the great English English writers and so forth. And I think we've had that, you know, and that's been nurtured here. I guess the worry is, yeah, we look at things like Grantland, which begat the, yeah. the, the TV stuff. For me, the written word, who pays for it, is obviously yeah. the issue. And we saw what happened with Grantland Um um, you know, being from, yeah, from lost, ASPM, lost. From, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. the ringer emerged and whatever. But there's still that. Does the pay model um, suit the written word? Whereas visually, I think we've never been better serviced at all. And we look with the AFL now are looking at um, through Amazon. You know, that there's a controversy about who will do it, but it is being done. And that that sort of depth of research and and documentary is there. But I think yeah, that, that's also the uh, I guess the disruption to the whole media space. You know, so like you said before. Um, you would write a piece, whether it's a reporting on something and that's how you would get it, or uh, it, it would be a longer opinion piece and you would take the time and you would open up the paper and you would read it and those models have been disrupted. So we're seeing news and Fairfax seeing their models change, seeing their owners change, mm. which, you know, um, is very different in this market with with multiple owners. Like they're still figuring out where all of that content goes and, and who pays, like, the ad model is it subscribers? A combination of both. You're a cog in that machine. You know, you're a cog in that machine. You're you're a a journalist, but you know now you're probably termed a content producer for to, to the grist to that mill. How how do you be a part of that machine and you know make it you know keep pursuing what you want to pursue? I'm probably lucky in that I. Um I you know, had a, a brief aborted kind of period with News Corp where I kind of went into that more content producer space. Yep. It probably didn't work out for me the way I wanted. I was there for about three or four years, um, you know, producing columns for the Daily Telegraph and there was some plans to do some other stuff for Fox Sports, but I wasn't probably the right peg in that hole, which was fine. Um, and that's, I guess, what we've seen is the development of that multi-skilled, multi-platformed journo and some transition to it better than others. I, I do a little bit of stuff on offsiders, but offsiders lends itself to the scruffy journal, I think, in a way. Yeah, kind yeah. Of, I think it all it's kind of a counterintuitive show where you don't have to be a really good presenter because your credibility comes from your contacts, your experience, your knowledge and the conversation where there is still a, uh, a thing with um, – certainly with um, TV where you need that sheen, that yeah. uh, production, and I, I wouldn't can certainly consider myself in that ilk. So the younger ones coming through, though, they, they develop these skills earlier and obviously part of the – you know, I've been to a few journalist 
school, journalism schools to yeah. do lectures and so forth and you could see they pitch themselves in that way and they also see themselves jumping the fence pretty quickly to communications which raises other concerns in a way because that's become quite blurred. Yeah, I mean that's the, that was sort of the case as – you know, AFL starts producing its own media, cricket starts producing its own media and everyone starts being their own media shops. It's like, well, who's going who's gonna to hold them accountable? You know, one of the things that journalism uh, journalists do is, you know, ask the big questions and ask the thorny questions. But if you're working for the, you know, for the company that you're, you're reporting on, it's, it's a really tough it's a really tough balance. Yeah, I know, and this is going back a few years, this isn't with the present model, yeah. but I know early days at the AFL talking to some friends who were working there for the AFL media, um, yeah. it was a really interesting dynamic where they tried to position themselves as being an independent media company, which is obviously quite absurd because yeah. they're paid for and working for the AFL. And so the way they pitched themselves independently was to sort of go pretty hard at the clubs. You know, they do stories that were kind of newspaper worthy, whether, you know, news stories, exposés or whatever, but without touching the executive of the AFL who are signing the checks. And yeah. this and this ended up getting the club's noses out of a joint because they're going, hang on, this yeah, is our, our own competition is kind of attacking of us here. here. And so yeah. they had to rein that back in. And I know it's, it's an awkward fit. And again, I don't want to... Um, to be seen to be attacking the people who work there because there's some really excellent, you know, writers and newsbreakers and stuff work doing, um, providing content for the AFL site now. And, you know, I think things like their, their pure footy thing, like their draft analysis and things like that are, are, are first rate. But there's always that sensitivity about, so if the AFL stuffs up at executive level, are they going to go as hard on that as they would elsewhere? Of course they're not. So... It's buyer beware. Yeah, and and you know that that club thing of you know club land versus you know HQ, which is not an AFL thing. It's every it's every league club dynamic. You know they're all trying to build off these models. You know the models started with Major League Baseball and the NBA, building out these media mo- you know monoliths that are starting to report. And so that's the model that they that they're falling. But it does. You, you, you can, it's like the church and state. You can't separate it. Like they're, they're still going to be part of the competition and there's still going to be, you know, arguments about their schedule and their draw as well as, you know, that the, the media piece. And I think the access piece is is tough because, like you said, they're, they're trying to build out this media model and, the, and it's like, well, who, who are they playing favours favors for? And I think the access piece... Is probably going to come with the with the, with the money piece. Like we're seeing now, Amazon is going to pay the money to be able to have the access to do the documentaries. How is that going to change? I guess the media that we consume, if the only people that get access are the people that hand over the cash. Well, it changes everything, of course, because you're beholden to you know the relationship. So it's a, it's the classic you know um, official media partner versus independent media operator, and it's 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 always interesting seeing that through a journalist's eye. But what I wonder is, you know, I often wonder, well, does just, you know, the average reader make that leap as well? I th- you know, some people are more media savvy than others. Other, they, they take that leap. But, you know, the, it is a propaganda exercise in, in some, in the most extreme yeah, examples. And, yep. and then again, it's only, it's, it's funny, I say this, it's a, it might be 1% of the occasions. Like I say, just to make an example, you know, Gillan McLaughlin stuffs up and gets a soft serve on AFL.com as he would probably rightly expect to do, but yeah. it's getting attacked elsewhere. Do people delineate that, you know, if their only news is the, you know, they get the pop-up um, from the AFL um, yep. app, do they, and that's their only story, do they understand that the AFL version is going to be a lot softer than the um, mainstream media versions? I'm not sure. And the thing is the mainstream medias will still have relationships as well and they've still got to have- – worry about their commercial interests on what the next rights deal looks like or or who they might offend and how that might affect what they what they do in their next relationship. Oh, and it's always been the way. I mean, look, our, our greatest compromise going back to earlier days when you had those closer relationships with people, when you were actually literally walking into the change rooms and yeah. training and talking to 10 players that you knew personally was how much does your personal relationship then affect the way you write about them. You had to be – There was a, it took a certain courage to write something pretty – critical about a club and then um, walk in front of them. I've got one story I actually really remember from I think it was just the eve of the 1988 grand final. I had a really good relationship with Melbourne's coach, John Northey, yep. and I wrote a quiet – and they 
I'd covered Melbourne for the past two years and they sent me to Hawthorne and they sent the Hawthorne reporter to Melbourne just to write. Yeah. And I wrote a piece saying how Hawthorne's training, just how brutal and attacking it was and they didn't use training bags and whatever. The next day I walked into the Melbourne offices to get something. I, I was on the eve of the grand final. And John Northey came up from behind and grabbed me and threw me to the floor and said, is that brutal enough? Are we, am I attacking? Do I need a tackling bag? And he'd, yeah. take, and he'd taken it that personally. And, as you know, he was half joking, yeah. half not. But you had that very eyeball relationship all the time. So the compromise would come there. It wasn't a commercial compromise. It was a, a personal compromise. So, you know, it's, it's always been there in media. And I guess the thing now from an online point of view is you're not having those personal backwards and forwards. So you, you don't know why coach so-and-so is not returning your calls or whatever because it might be for one sentence or a you know one phrase one turn of phrase in an article because you're not you're not getting that access you're not having that banter backwards and forwards that you might have had back in the day yeah I think the what I see with again with the younger journalists and this is my fear and I kind Mm. of you know I try to you know I'm sounding like the grizzled old man but I try to reach out to to younger journalists if I see something that I think I could advise them on and I see a lack of empathy and I think that comes from disconnection they don't they don't have that eyeball relationship they don't have that feedback all the time so they go a bit hard and they can be really brutal about things online or on their Twitter accounts or say things very quite cutting that I you wouldn't normally say I think if you were going to have that you know see them the next day and I think they go over the top so I think I think that virtual relationship has created a lack of empathy and then that can stem towards um, players and coaches being, you know, criticised. It, it could, if you take it to the, the vast extreme mental health things, come yeah. in both ways, you know, it, it comes over the fence the other way as well. So I think, yeah, that's that's one thing that's been lost. And it's, a you know, um, sort of touching on that online space, you're a you're an ab, uh, active and, and avid uh, user of Twitter, uh, RD Hines, if you want to follow Richard. Um were you always? Like when it first came out, like, you know, I remember talking to a bunch of journalists early on um, about it. What was your first take and how, how did you uh, get into Twitter? No, I was, a, I was a classic eye roller. I remember a colleague of mine, Emma Quayle, yep. who's a terrific, she was a terrific draft writer and she's now working the in Giants. recruiting at the Giants, and a fantastic journo and now really good at what she does there. But um, she was into it. We were talking about it at the tennis, and I'm like, I will never get into that. And then she's like, no, no, try it. And one becomes 100 pretty quickly because you yeah. get that, that interaction that you don't get. And it, it's, it's interesting for journalists because there is the intoxication of that instant response. And, of course, it's snowballed a lot over the years. So I've gone, I've gone through various phases over the maybe 10 years I've used it where I've gone into heavy interaction with people, but then that can snowball into you, you start getting paranoid and getting yeah. – to top, and then I've gone into kind of just putting columns up for a while, you yeah. know, and just no just res- being in publisher mode, no responses. Yeah. <laughs> and then I have, you know, I've got some comedy stuff going on. I'm a, a cricket nut and a yeah. really bad opening batsman, so I started a hashtag called Real Openers, yeah. which is about slow batting and an appreciation yeah. of that. And yeah. I think people like that because it's just gentle and warm about yeah. cricket. So I have various iterations, but I, I, yeah, I fall in and out of love with it. I guess my latest iteration is to I, I interact. But I'm I'm less um, I don't I try to take away anything with two meanings because yep. people I find that people just even if you respond just thoughtfully or you know almost agree with them they instantly think by responding you're in a fight with them. Yeah, there's a bit of that out- outrage culture that is online. It's yeah. like I'm, I'm here for a fight. Hang on, you're not fighting with me. What's going yeah. on? I, yeah. I often now use the word respectfully. I yeah. say, look, I respectfully disagree, and I hope that that just makes them. So look, I'm I've just I'm just respectfully putting a counter opinion. I'm not punching Same. you in the face yeah. and you know um, breaking my bottle and holding it at your throat. I'm just saying, look, I from what I understand, um, but it is, is different. Uh, <laughs> but it is it is it is challenging. Like you know, mm. like I remember, I think I was talking to uh, Finn Bradshaw, who was working with all the news guys mm. early on, and I said, hey, happy to you know. Uh, talk to the, talk to all the journalists and and help them understand what the platform is. It's a great way to connect with the you know, the common man, uh, the common woman, um, and sort of get a feel for what the what they're saying. Um, and like no 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 no. And then you know then all of them eventually got on. And you can use it just as a bull pit, all right? Mm-hmm. Hey, this is me. I'm going to say my stuff and and I'm going to block everybody and not listen to everybody, yeah. which is one way of doing it. And then there's others that sort of get a bit into the banter, but you can get stuck in the weeds really quickly. Yeah, you, like, can, <laughs> you, can, you can very quick. Oh, look, I've, I, I can't tell you the number of times that I've um, 
got into something and just realized, oh, I'm, I'm way too deep into this. And it's usually well-meaning. You start off with, you, it might be a joke that can be taken two ways yeah. or a, a statement that you're just contradicting someone based on on fact. And as a journalist, it's, it's an interesting thing, it just as a, a bit of an aside about social media. It's given voice, public voice to everyone's opinion. And the most frustrating thing you find as a journalist is you might – literally have been with the first source on a story um i'll give you an uh, mm. okay i'm i got to, to know Ange postacoglu quite yep. quite well through offsiders and you yep. know, have the, the odd coffee with him and yep. so, so forth and whatever is so, former soccer is coach yeah yep. yeah so i'm um, so i had really first-hand knowledge of some stuff going on and i occasionally you'd see things and you go oh actually no nah, it's this and people are like no no it's this this and, and it's so frustrating and then you have to pull yourself back and go well look there's no way without betraying a confidence or yep. without that I can tell you you know this but it's kind of a frustrating media because it's empowered people and to to believe that their opinion is as strong as your fact yeah but sometimes you can't really demonstrate why you have that fact and that's journalism and it's why I still write columns because I still am I able to ring people up, you know, I've still got enough CEOs and coaches and players yeah. in, my, in my phone that I can I can validate what I'm writing. But the empowerment of the opinion has probably been one of the great things of – or not so great things of social media. But it, And it has been like the challenge and I think it is for young journalists and, you know, we – you know, I'm a big NBA fan and, you know, Adrian Wojnarowski, Woj Bomb, like he pretty much just – turns the internet when an NBA trade's about to happen like, and he makes a mockery of the draft. Like he announces the draft picks before the commissioner walks up there to a point where the ESPN had to say stop, stop doing it. Yeah. Um, and he breaks so much like content on, on Twitter, he doesn't actually bring it, the, the traffic back uh, you know, to, the, to the website, which is, again, if, if you're writing articles and writing opinion pieces, you don't want to have this conversation on this platform over here. You're, you know, you're being paid to drive eyeballs and viewership yeah. and dwell time on, on, on websites. So you sort of see um, young journalists or a bunch of journalists are sort of going, well, I'm going to make a name for myself and know this is where, you know, this is where the breaking news is happening. But, it's, but you've also got to realise that, you know, your end goal should be, you know, the, you know, your column or engaging with your piece. But I do think it gives you an opportunity to expand your, you know, your personal brand, right? Yeah, so people can... It certainly does. But on the case like the Woj Bombs, I, I think that's just a great example of just purely in my craft. And I, I hived off into feature writing and opinion yep. and whatever. News is God. And I've yep. always deferred... In my office, you know, I was never a great news breaker by any means. You know, I had periods covering teams and stuff where you'd get stories and whatever, but I'd, I I was more of a colour writer and an, an opinion writer. News is God in our industry and it still is. You know, yep. in those, if that that just pure, this is going to happen, you know, with, whether AFL or, you know, a coach sacking story or all the great, you know, a player signing, whatever, they're our God. So it's, it's actually reassuring in a way that they are still the – you know, something pure like that goes off and that's that's the big talking point. Because I, I, like I said, I deferred to that, you know, I worked with people in AFL um, like uh, Mike Sheehan and Caroline Wilson and then later Jake Nile and the, these people who were just so good at being first. And I, yep. I, lo- I love the fact that that's still, that purity of news is still cutting and, through. Yeah, and it's still like even though you have, uh, you know, the leaks or the people saying that they know stuff, like you can still have those big stories broken by you know those kind of journalists, mm. and that's how you find out about them. Yes, um, you know I, you know I talk about Twitter as a, you know, as a distribution platform. Like it's where you might find out about it, but you're still going to end up going back to the original source, who wrote it, what's the, you know, what is more of the depth, because you've got to go past, the, you know, past the headline at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the pieces that what caused me to reach out to you uh, was a piece you wrote around stadium size and, and crowds and, um, you know, I shared it on my LinkedIn to say, you know, really interesting piece sort of coming off the back of cricket season and, you know, seeing small crowds in big stadiums and, and that kind of piece. What, yeah, what were your thoughts? Where did you, where did you start scratching that itch and, uh, for that type of story and, and, you know, what are your thoughts on that space? Yeah, well, look, my, my, it's funny, my stadium interest probably goes back to my days. I, I moved up to Sydney to work for the Sydney Morning Herald before the 2000 Olympics. Yep. And being from Melbourne where we just take for granted good stadia, yep. I think um, the the Docklands in its various name incarnations had just was being built or being built. The MCG had been renovated and Sydney were building, you know, stadiums around the Olympics. But... I, I covered the Swans and a bit of other, you know, a bit of rugby league and whatever. And it just struck me the difference between their 
their stadia, so forth, and that sparked a debate that still goes on to this day, 20 years later. And I, I was very much a proponent of why aren't they providing stadiums that would attract bigger crowds. Um, they'd already probably – the AFL, had, <laughs> as usual, yeah. kind of interfered in their model by getting involved with the um, Olympic Stadium, which meant that it had to be a an oval configuration, yep. which basically ruined it, in my opinion, for Union League and football. Yep. The, you know, three challenging codes in the in the city, but it's such a compli- com- complicated market, Sydney, with you know, the crowd sizes di- in different games, the geographical differences, the the kind of self defeating idea that rugby league is a great TV game, so just stay home and watch it at yep. four o'clock, delayed on a on a Sunday. So for a long time, so I guess I got really passionately involved and did a lot of research into stadiums, talked to a lot of people up there around it. So it's been a an ongoing thing of mine. The the stadium model thing, I guess, is really interesting. I think um, to to kind of paraphrase what I wrote in the column, I think it's interesting that the AFL, for, for you know, and good on them, they've just been so good at uh, lobbying government money. Other codes would say hijacking the stadium yep. agenda. They would say driving it. That they've built stadiums on a model that suits them, but their their crowds are wildly disproportionate to most models elsewhere, including yeah. even the Premier League. I think um, the usual survey is like I think German soccer, German football is the one that they vie with for biggest average crowds and college football in America, which is kind of a religion, but although even that's coming back and I think they're building smaller stadiums. So we have, of course, we've been – we're almost stuck with these – the Coliseums, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, are, that are big, yeah, yeah, and you know the Australian market is a, is is a strange one. Like I talk to people in the in the US around the stadiums that are being built there, and they are very much being built, uh, you know, for the for the market. So if you look at uh, LAFC Stadium, uh, Bank of California Stadium, like it's in the you know it's it's close to downtown LA. And it seats, I think, fourteen or fifteen thousand. Might be seventeen. Apologies, Colin, if I've got it wrong. <laughs> um, but it's, but it, but you know, then you fill it and you get all the, get all the atmosphere. Whereas, yeah. and a lot of the stadiums in the US are privately funded, either by the teams or the owners. And here, we've always got it's government funding, like you said. This, yeah. you know, you have to lobby government to get it. And so then it always the stadium always gets upgraded to oh, we need it for for this big event. Yeah, which you know, so it's five key events a year. But that means there's 55 or 60 or 100 dates that it's doesn't feel it's not at capacity. Yeah, and we have a share model, obviously. Mm. So we've got dis, um, sports with disparate um, crowds, different, vastly different averages, sharing the same stadiums, and not, uh, we don't have a population big enough to support uh, more. Yep. So it's it's a really really complex area. Um, I just see, I you know, I did a bit of research and you can just see though that the the models around the world are going smaller. It's interesting, even some of those colleges that have rebuilt, or baseball particularly, I think the yep. last five new yeah, baseball small, stadiums yeah. were smaller than the ones I they I think the only one replaced. would have been Yankees when they pretty much did a carbon copy of Yankee Stadium. Yeah, but I think it was <laughs> slightly smaller than the original yeah. because of some of the um, boxes and so forth. And so, and so they're, yeah, and most of them are seeing um, more of an event experience. It's all about the fan experience. So yeah. they're like, we don't need all those seats there. Let's make it a, a, a deck and it's a bar and you can stand there and mm. there's football or baseball or soccer or basketball happening in the background and it's yeah. an, an experience and so I think that's where it's going to be interesting to see what the AFL does now that it owns Marvel Stadium, what it's going to look like in its next, you know, incarnation. And it's, you know, pretty amazing that they own the stadium and they're probably going to get the government to chip in for whatever the redevelopment yeah. is because that's what they're good at doing. They're masters of it. Um, but it is, you know, the it makes sense that stadiums go smaller because crowds are falling globally. Yeah. Like the people aren't are going to as much because we've got – we're spoiled for choice of so many different products available. Yeah, and it's interesting the AFL have even, I know, privately considered building a smaller boutique stadium whether, you know, there was some support for upgrading um, the old Princess Park or the, I think there was some area in – North Melbourne around the railway yards around yep. there, you know that. that um, Eddie McGuire was floating, you know, uh, uh, another one near MCG and and Punt Road Oval, like like <laughs> this. Eddie's Eddie always going to be <laughs> be involved in something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting that even the AFL, who are counter to the argument, I think the sport that suffers the most for this is football in Australia. I I I, I kind of feel for them because they they not only play in outsized stadiums that don't lend themselves to the atmosphere, which is such a great part of the A-League. And I, yep. I think people forget the early years of the A-League a little bit now that it's 
in a bit of a trough. Just some of the great atmospheres that created and how people were going along just to hear hear the crowd, you know, yep. and, that, and it's a benefit. But they also get secondhand surfaces and so forth. They are, in my opinion, slightly a victim of their own poor government lobbying in that they put too many eggs in the Lowy basket. And yep. when Lowy went down the World Cup bid road and that failed spectacularly and now he's out of the game, they lost all their government credits, whereas the AFL have been spectacularly good at lobbying. I used to, again, living in Sydney, I used to talk to NRL officials and FFA officials a little bit and they'd say, how's, you know, how does bloody it AFL, yeah. bloody... And I said, well, okay, who have you got camped on a stretcher bed outside the treasurer's office, the sports minister's office, the prime minister's office? You know, who, who's your local government expert getting funding at that level, your state level? The AFL did a tremendous job. And whether you want to say, well, that's, you know, they blindsided the other sports or they hijacked the agenda, however you want to put it, they, they did the hard yards and the other sports played catch up. So that's how they drove the stadium agenda. Yeah, and it is it's going to be interesting to see how it, you know, it, it, it develops. I mean... The stadiums are what they are. They're not, you know, whether a new stadium pops up. I mean, we'll be interested to see how the guys at Western United build that smaller stadium for Western United. Yeah. Um, you know, it's tough for them, you know, being in multiple homes at the at the minute. But once they do, you know, uh, get that stadium up and running, um, it is in that model of, you know, LAFC smaller style and provide that atmosphere. Um, but, uh, yeah, they've got a lot of road ahead of them on that. Yeah, home stadiums are such a part of club identity. And, again, I, I guess we throw, you know, probably a bit of an Anglo bias on my part and I lived in London for a while. But I just loved when I lived there going, not only going to watch games, but going to the little, you know, I'm a QPR supporter. It's in Loftus Road, I think it was 24,000. Then you go to the Den at Millwall and it was a different experience at every game. And, it, and again, I, I guess it gets back to football particularly is deprived of that sort of gut level, you know, root and branch kind of connection that those those stadiums provide in Australia. Yep. A lot of the focus um, in the media and, and a lot of the folks for your work previously has been looking at the top level of sport. Um, but one of the things I think Australia does really well and uh, is actually getting people playing sport and had, you know, recent guests talking about that. You started dabbling in and sort of looking at grassroots sport recently. Why has that become a bit of a focus for you? Like a lot of Parents, I guess I had an older boy. He's now 21. I played cricket with him for a couple of seasons yep. down on the peninsula and now I've got a boy who's 13 and I, I actually started a father-son or parent, actually parent-child team this year because yep. some girls coming through. Um, and I've just got involved in my local club. I'm vice president of Edinburgh Cricket Club. And so through that, what I saw was I went down to our club and I – we're in a growth area here. It's been gentrified. People have come back in. There's a, there's been an enormous boom. We, at one stage, I think we had 150 Milo in our Bullworth Blast kids, yep. seven under 10 teams, seven under 12 teams, five under four. We had just a massive, I think we're the second biggest community club in Australia or Victoria at okay. least. Yep. What I saw though was this massive drop off at the 12 to 13 age group and it Oh, it, it frustrated me because people saw it as an inevitability. It'd be like, oh, you know, they've got school, they've got homework, yep. other sports, yeah, there's e more extracurricular sports, stuff. which is a passion of yours. Yeah, and but there's computers. more extracurricular stuff at high school. Yeah, and, oh, whatever. You know, the homework load and all of that kind yeah. of stuff. And so I just, I just thought, no, it doesn't have to be as inevitable. Of course, not every kid is a cricketer and wants to be. So yeah. I, I started a program myself, which is called Cricketer for Life, which I've had some done some work with um, and I'm driving through at the moment. It's about keeping kids playing the game and there's various aspects to it and it's still a bit under wraps at the moment but it's, you know, been successful so far and it's a it's just a pure retention program and I don't think enough work is being put into that level. Sports drive really hard at um, entry, well, entry yeah, level, acquiring, yeah, entry getting, level yeah. early age but not enough in keeping and that there's, I guess, two levels to that. There's getting the clubs to do the hard work and there's so much knowledge at grassroots so part of my program is getting clubs together and rather than telling them you know we, we have a broad framework for them to work with but yep. it's also hearing their stories because these people work with clubs there's so much knowledge that comes out of clubs I've learned working with other clubs yeah learned so much myself that I wouldn't learn from even the top levels of the game um, the next level of that is maintaining our clubs participation culture and I'm yep. really passionate on this I think I'd hate to see us go down the American road where there's just steep cliffs where so you stop playing yeah. football after high school 
if you don't make it to college, just just stop playing after college. If you don't make it to, and ice. that's the thing that's uniquely you know uniquely Australian that club network and that volunteer run, yeah. you know, multiple leagues in multiple multiple sports. It's a challenge to keep people playing, yeah. Um, but it's still you know it is relatively uniquely Australian, yeah. And I think I think cricket gets it. I yeah. mean, I've, I've had a bit to do with Belinda Clark, who's the head of community cricket at Cricket Australia, and yep. she's passionately her and her team are passionately engaged in in doing just that i think the board has changed a bit i think it went down a very corporate road for a while and you know probably there weren't enough people invested in the game i think it's that's headed back the other way and i think they understand there's a statistic i think it might have been the afl who came up with it that people who play the game up to i think it was 18 or 20 mm. are seven times more likely to be consumers you know to to buy merchandise exactly, to go yeah. to games to so be connected mm. yeah so if you keep playing people playing not only are you not only are you milking the health benefits and that sort of aspect you're getting the commercial benefit as well so that's that's a sell for the top level and it's a really reason why they should really good reason they should be passionately connected with that's, their grassroots yeah. and that's pretty much a conversation i had with dino dipiomenico around you know the work that they've done in auskick and you know talking to luke bold around what they're doing is exactly that like 80 again i can't remember the stuff but it is like a high percentage of the commercial Revenue, the ticket buyers, the membership people, the people are turning up in attendance are people that play the game to a certain level, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, if they drop off at 6, 7, 8 or 12, 13, 14, then you might not get them. Yeah. So back to our question of how do we fill these stadiums? Yes, you can be doing all these bells and whistles and fireworks and hand out, hand out you know, trinkets to get people in, which is a bit of, you know, fan engagement trickery, but it's like if you actually embed – a love of the sport and why you're doing it, yeah. then they're more likely to lock in and go, oh, that's, you know, that's what I, you know, yeah. that's what I do. And they lock into other aspects. So it's interesting. The cliche is, oh, kids are only interested in BBL. And of course, that's a massive reason why we get so many entry level early age junior kids. They come yep. along, they've seen the BBL all summer, they want to play. But it's interesting. So I coached under 12s and, you know, my kid's playing under 14 now. Once they get up to that level and they keep playing, they suddenly become in, interested in test cricket because to watch test cricket, there's a playing element. You can, To appreciate it, you you know, if you've played, you understand why it's so hard to play that bowling or whatever. And so they, these kids suddenly get more and more interested in test cricket. So for the, the future of all forms of the game um, – it's important. The retention piece, particularly, is really important. I think not just the participation piece. And from a from a um, from a journalism point of view, from Colin point of view, have you been getting good feedback in talking more about that grassroots piece from an Australian point of view? Yeah, absolutely. Because people are invested. You know, they have their own stories and their own. You know, their parents playing. You know, it's really interesting. The the girls' sports space now is enormous. You know, yep. and and we're right in the heart of it in in my area here in Fitzroy. Our we have four junior girls teams and our, we're hoping to get two women's teams. We've got one women's team at the moment. Um, the Oz Kick and junior girls program at Fitzroy Footy Club's enormous. Yep. So that's a particularly, you know, that's a really hot area of conversation, how we, again, um, accommodate those people, you know, and that and it, I think that was, you know, you talk about the, the, the recent sports rorts affair. Yep. That was really interesting. So tapping into that the passion of people around that because they're at the heart of that. They're invested in getting these kids playing, look, creating opportunities for them, building their clubs. And so how that was, you know, that played out, it was really interesting to see the passion that evoked and it, it defied any party political lines. These were just people who have put a lot of hard work into trying to get their funds, get their clubs going. And whether or not they were right or wrong in terms of whether they'd been ripped off themselves, I think that really struck a nerve with people and showed how invested and passionate people are about community sport yeah and i and i think it is that community aspect i think you know um our state new south wales has just gone through some devastating bushfires and you know devastating communities and i think it will be community clubs it will be the local footy club the local cricket club that will help you know rebuild and reconnect that community like that that, yeah. that will be focused on how do we get the sheds back and operational how do we make sure the oval's right to play for the and it will bring the community together and become that backbone of you know especially country regions but i think you know that's and i think in the city like we are missing that community <laughs> yeah it's absolutely true it's funny i i grew up in a little town called warwick near Beale, out in the wimmera yep. i did all my primary school there and i went back there and been back for years and we drove into town on a Saturday afternoon and I thought, oh, my God, the whole town's abandoned and whatever. Yep. 
And then we drove down to Anzac Park where the game was and the whole town was there still just just as it was, you know, 40 and years ago when I was a kid. And you know, big around, around and, and, and it was just four or literally six. the town was dead because the footy was being played and that's it's where people meet, it's where people, you know, associate, form plans and build communities. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and one of the marvellous things about living in this area is how that's organically occurred over my time here where these clubs, which were – the Brunswick Street, the local yep. oval, was virtually abandoned by, you know, in, well, Fitzroy Footy Club left yep. in 66 and then Fitzroy Cricket Club went out to Doncaster in 86. So yep. they had these beautiful facilities but they've been regenerated now by people, you know. It's just people getting together and forming friendships and it's it's a terrific community to live in with a real soul Yep. Um, and sports played a, a very large part in that. And that's the challenge for, you know, the high-level sports executives to go, this is a really – it's not a quick fix – Right, but you have to invest in this this piece. Yeah. You know, um, you know, we're seeing many sports. You know, seeing the seeing the benefits of investing in women's sport, and you know, the amount of girls that are now playing footy and cricket because the WBBL and the AFLW are getting more exposure. Mm. But it's like that they're now starting to realise. Well, it does start with grassroots. <laughs> Yeah, and the reality of life is it's, you know, the motivation is going to be what's in it for me, as we saw, you know, yeah. it's the votes and so yeah. forth or whether it's the commercial opportunities for leagues. So, you know, the AFLW pay, um, dis- what's on a, well, there was a dispute last year, but now there's kind of been a concern about that so the men might have to take a cut for the AFLW women to get more. Yep. But then if you look at where's who's driving the greatest growth in uh, participation growth now, potentially retention growth, and then overall growth. If these the young girls playing become lifetime consumers of football, that's in the women's space, and it's largely because of the women's league. So yeah. it's justifiable on those grounds, in my in my opinion. And it is up to the AFL to appropriately commercialise that entity, which they are starting to do. But like. You know, the first year is like, oh, you guys have got the coverage. You guys can have the AFL women. It's like, well, it is actually of it is as of value to broadcasters and to brands that are coming into the space. So it's just a matter of, yeah. I guess, commercialising the way they've done the AFL, which yeah. they've done a really good job of. It was a kind of counterintuitive um, um, debut, though. I think as as you know, as worthy as the the idea was, and you know, good on Gil McLaughlin for driving it. I think there was a certain element of them doing it as a kind of a bit of a bulwark against participation in junior uh, yep. girls soccer and other areas. I'm not sure if they had any idea of the pent up demand no, for no, the game were, itself. I think they, you know, whether yeah. they would admit it or you yeah. know, they were like, "We're going to do this," and yeah. yeah, they were completely surprised, I guess, by you know the uh, yeah, you're right, the, the pent up demand and the passion around it, and mm. the fact that it, there's a whole fan segment that has not engaged with the AFL because yeah. they've been largely ignored. Yeah. you know, for over 100 years and now they're like, oh, this is ours, we're now being accepted yeah. and they, you know, probably underestimated, I guess, the the fervour by, you know, that yeah. has received. And the passion you talk about is interesting because it's, I say it's almost like a, it's a movement in a yeah. way. It's, so it's different to men's in that it's a sport. We watch the mm. sport, go to the game, we've, you know, played it and whatever, but there's a movement that takes it into all these other different areas around women's rights and so forth that need to be addressed and, looked after I think it was interesting that they didn't have the transgender um, piece in place before starting the competition which yep. ra- they ran into some problems with that and so forth so I'm not sure they've been totally prepared for just the the, the groundswell and the momentum it's created but it's but it's been from a from an observer's point of view it's been in, really interesting and great to watch and it, I think it's probably been the best mix of what we've been talking about before about that community aspect and professionalism Right, because it has that very much that community feel, and what you're talking about before of going up to the side and and talking to one of the players and talking to the co- you've got that access because they're all you know really welcoming of every piece of coverage, but also reaching out to all the fans. So you're getting really strong connection. Whereas you know things like Twitter and people having their pot shots at players like AFL players have, and you know professional players in other leagues are like they stand off. A little bit because they don't want to get attacked and they're trying to protect their personal brand and that kind of thing so it's created some distance between fans whereas with a lot of the women's sports you know you can, you know young girls and young young fans can connect with these stars 
you know, mm. at a game, shake their hand, get an autograph. Yeah. And that means a lot to those fans. Yeah. And going back to our original, you know, our stadium piece, I, I mentioned it in the column I wrote, but, you know, the intimacy of the old suburban stadiums yeah. being reused and um, that's, been, that's been a big winner for them as well. So, Richard, I want to uh, finish off with the closing five. Do you remember the first sports event you ever attended? Well, outside of my little town of Warwick, New yeah. <laughs> where I go and watch the Lions every Saturday, uh, my Saturday afternoons, um, yeah, my, my parents were from New South Wales, so I hadn't been to a lot of sport in Melbourne, but we used to go up on holidays on the Central Coast and we dropped in the 74-75 fifth test between okay. Australia and England. Yep. And it was test Australia retained the ashes. Greg Chappell made 149 on the day I was there and Doug Walters got a standing ovation for 18. It was the height of that great Australian side and I'll never forget it, the SCG packed and heaving. Yes, definitely, definitely. And you would have been to a few sports events in your time. Do you have a favourite food memory or a go-to go to food when you're at a sports event? This is going to sound extremely um, arrogant, <laughs> but <laughs> at, at Augusta, okay. at, at the golf there, the press are treated like royalty. I think it's to suppress all the bad memories the club yep. has of the past, if anyone knows the true history of Augusta. Yep. But I remember the first time a, a golf riding friend of mine said, come up to the balcony, we'll go and have – the clam chowder and we sat yep. on the balcony eating clam chowder and Jack Nicholas was on the, the next table and I think Nick Valdo was too, too along and you're looking over the, the beautiful Augusta golf course. That was fairly hard to beat. No, that's a, it's not a bad not a memory at all. Um, what's the first app you open in the morning? I go to the English football apps. Oh, sorry, the world football apps okay. usually because I, I, I'm a, um, a, a – Quite a big football consumer. So the first, thing, the, the thing I cannot stay up for usually is you know the European football and yep. the the one the cup o'clock. And, the team, and I must uh, admit, you know, if my tragic old QPR have played a Wednesday night game at Derby or something, I want to mm. know that we, how many we lost by. So <laughs> yeah, that's a, for some reason, I was just go through the English football results first on the various um, soccer apps. Um, who is someone that you either follow or read potentially that you suggest the the Sports Geek podcast listeners? Uh, follow and check out. I'm a big fan of the great cricketer, I must admit, and I've had a bit to do with them. You know, yep. Sam Perry, one of the um, founders, did a turn at our club night. But I just I love how they've captured a little market. I really like people. I think that's one of the great things about social media online is those people who just fill a really great niche. Yep. And they've just captured the essence of what it's like actually playing the game and that, that macho alpha um, culture of, you know, it's kind of the worst and best of club cricket. So yep. great cricketer is a bit of a go-to of mine. Yeah, so check out the great cricketer on Twitter uh, for all things there. And um, so lastly, what uh, social media platform is your MVP? Well, I, I guess I'm a bit of an old Twitter tragic. I know I'm, I know everyone's moved on to TikTok and that's probably old hat <laughs> now or something. I know my, my, my I haven't seen too many sports journals on TikTok. <laughs> that not, would be yeah, that, yeah. I'd like to see someone like Robbo or uh, you know or, or Bill Simmons or uh, Woj on TikTok. That would be uh, that would be a turn up. Yeah. So no, I, I, I guess I still enjoy. I, as we mentioned previously, I have a bit of a love hate relationship with it because I, I find you know you can't and you find yourself in a fight you didn't pick. But, yep. um, yeah, I still find it good for, I, you know, I put out my columns twice a week that, that I write on the ABC um, site and, you know, it's it's just really good getting the instant response and occasionally getting the um, odd spelling mistake pointed out to you as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that's where it is. Like it, it is a good publishing platform and a way to have a conversation if you want and it is about managing your time. But then also when there is a live experience it, you know, you can still get that experience of I'm watching this with everybody else, whether it's a big live news breaking event um, or, a, you, know, a, a, you know, a shared experience, you know, like, uh, you know, that Aussie's playing England in, at Lords or, or whatever and everyone's on the same couch and we're all yeah. tweeting about the same thing. Yeah. It's funny you say that. I, I think it was during the Ashes. I, I, I found myself, you know, with phone in hand looking at the screen and I'm like, oh, God, I'm, you know, am I concentrating? And then I, I looked it up and there was a stat that I think 80% of people now watch um, – TV or screen, whatever mm. screen they're watching with a second device. So I thought, oh, I'm, I'm part of the majority. I felt a, bit, a little bit relieved because I thought I'd lost my powers of concentration, but everyone has. There is a, yeah, there is a bit of that. And there is a bit of, um, you know, they talk about the phone as the second screen. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I think it might be the first screen. <laughs> like there's a little bit of, oh, I'm looking for my, you know, 
witty take or have my say or like, you know, and again, back to that, you know, you're a journalist building out your brain. Like if you have the right take at the right time um, about something, you're effectively, you know, the fifth, sixth, thousandth colour commentator on the coverage. Yeah, it's interesting. I think my brand has been long ago built and probably under renovation and possibly condemned. But anyway, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's good to be part of the conversation still anyway. Well, thank you very much for coming to the podcast. Where can people find you if they wanted to reach out, say hello, say they listen to the podcast? What's the um, best platform? Yeah, probably, yeah, at, uh, on Twitter at, at R.D. Hines, H-I-N-D-S. But, um, yeah, say good day. Well, thank you very much, Richard. As I said, you can follow Richard on Twitter and keep up to date with his uh, – Musings on the world of sports, business, grassroots, everything in that sort of space as well. If you want to talk uh, about uh, cricketers and uh, making runs slowly, you can also chat to Richard about that. (laughs) Anytime. Thanks, mate. We'd love your support on our Patreon campaign. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash Patreon. Thanks again to Richard. Uh, Richard Hines, you can connect with him and send him a tweet. R.D. Hines, R-D-H-I-N-D-S on Twitter. Or you can find all the links uh, from this podcast and from every podcast by using the show number. This is show 270. Uh, so you go to sportsgeekhq.com slash 270. But, yes, yeah, send, please send uh, Richard a tweet, especially if you're tweeting about cricket or you want to talk about grassroots sports. Um please send him a tweet telling him that you listen to the podcast. Um, just a bit of an update on uh, what I'm doing behind the scenes uh, when I'm not podcasting. I have answered this actually recently on a, one of the Q&A episodes, but um, recently did a new digital team workshop with some new content at the start, uh, a new keynote that I've titled Steal with Pride. Um, effectively, it goes through best trends um, of the internet, um, looking at some of the, uh, the trends of where the audiences are moving and some of the trends on different platforms as well as uh, tapping into um, some of the trends from people like Mary Meeker and the like um, as well as looking at uh, some of the best practice in the world of sport. Um, so it was a really good exercise and a really good workshop to sort of kick things off with that and then we looked dive into a little bit of content design. How do you go about designing your content that your team wants to develop but then also how to work on how your team both develops those content ideas but then learns to pitch those content ideas whether they're being pitched to just your boss uh, whether they're being pitched to sponsorship whether they're being pitched to the ceo um, because you have to get funding for some of these content initiatives so really giving the uh, digital team some skills on why they might do it how they would go about pitching it and um, and how they can really tackle those really big ideas so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, um, happy to talk to you about what a workshop might look like for your team. Um, I'm also ready to have a chat and have a call with anyone who is a podcast listeners. Um, I've made it pretty obvious for 2020. I want to work on big problems um, and help solve them and work on these big projects, these real game changers. Uh, so if you've got one of those in your on your desk that you haven't been able to tackle and you haven't had the bandwidth to do, let's see if we can help unlock that. Um, if you want to booking for time to have a chat simply go to sportsgeekhq.com slash phone call um, and don't forget please send in your questions um, for the Q&A episodes um, I'm really enjoying doing those I tackle three questions as quickly as I can in a short form um, and it's much better if the questions are coming from you and I don't have to make them up so go to sportsgeekhq.com slash questions um, I'm sort of trying to batch them all up together and, and knock them out um, so I can get a month's Q&A episodes done in the one one hit. Uh, so I'm accepting questions right now. So please send them in. And as always, if you're enjoying this podcast, if you're enjoying our podcast both on a Tuesday and a Friday and also Sports Geek News, um, I'd really appreciate it if you would support what we're doing with our Patreon campaign. Simply go to sportsgeekhq.com slash Patreon. Until next episode... My name is Sean Callanan, and you've been listening to Sports Geek. Join Sports Geek Nation access to exclusive Slack and Facebook groups with regular Q&A sessions with Sean Callanan. Go to sportsgeeknation.com to join. Got a question for Sean? Send it in for our Sports Geek Q&A series. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash questions.
Go to sportsgeekhq.com for more sports digital marketing resources.